Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Harvey. Fair, factual, and funny. Two out of three is not bad. <laughs> Although when you uh, mention uh, John F. Kennedy so many times, people in the audience are going to expect they're going to hear a speech tonight as eloquent as those that John F. Kennedy used to give, forgetting that he had a much better speechwriter than I do. <laughs> I don't want all of you in the audience to be concerned at all about the fact that I cannot see you. I had a little uh, hesitation in finding my way um, up here. Uh, my eyesight's not so good, but I have more vision than the current President of the United States. <laughs> As I mentioned in my book, uh, 80 years ago this year, I was born and my father was elected Attorney General of Nebraska. He later would tell me how, as Attorney General, he was invited to deliver a talk at the Sunday morning chapel service at the state penitentiary here in Lincoln. And he got up before that crowd and was a little bit like me right now, not sure how to begin. He couldn't say my friends, he didn't really know any of them. <laughs> he couldn't say the usual ladies and gentlemen, that would be stretching it a bit. He uh, couldn't say fellow citizens, that would be rubbing in the fact he had taken away some of the citizenship uh, rights. So finally, he just uh, began, as I do, I'm so glad to see so many of you here. <laughs> and that wasn't right either. When Harvey wrote me many months ago asking me to deliver this lecture, and I thought about a topic and title, I thought that a contrast between uh, the uh, then and now President of the United States and my president uh, in, uh, elected in 60 and his role in the Cuban Missile Crisis in 62 uh, might uh, provide, be instructive. But now I find myself a bit like the uh, doctor who was called in the middle of the night, awakened, he said, doctor, doctor, this is... Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, this is uh, this is John uh, Jerome, and uh, you've got to come over right away, or I'll meet you at the hospital right away. My wife is suffering from acute appendicitis, and the doctor said, "No, no, just take it easy. There's no need for alarm or any midnight uh, meetings. I remember I removed your wife's appendix last year, and there's no such thing as a new appendix." Yes, doctor, have you ever heard of a new wife? <laughs> I'm in the same situation because things have changed and are going to change a great deal because we have a new president. I received, uh, why should I write my own stuff? I received a letter from uh, a stranger in Ireland who had uh, read my uh, book including the chapter near the end where I refer to the fact that when abroad uh, several years, a few years ago, just a few years ago, in a, in a foreign capital, friendly country, a local organization heard that I was in town, asked me to come and address their organization, and I said, uh, when I got there, I said to the chairman, what do you want me to speak about? He said, tell us about the good America when you and Kennedy were in the White House. I said, it's still a good America. Yeah, the American people, whatever uh, you know, they may have in office from one term to another, the American people are essentially good, they are compassionate, they are generous, and they are 
committed to peace. And this stranger, I received a letter just before I set out on this trip. He said, Obama's election is going to liberate the goodness of America, which you refer to in your book. I thought that's a pretty good way of putting it. I certainly couldn't have put it better myself. And uh, a month earlier, before the election outcome was clear, I received a letter from a very distinguished foreign statesman whom I have known over the years at the UN, at the United Nations. And he said, because he knew I was supporting Obama, if Obama is elected, the day he walks into the White House, that day, respect for America around the world will rise immeasurably. And I believe that's true. And that is what brings me to the contrast between presidential leadership in the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962 and the kind of foreign policy leadership that we have had during these uh, last uh, years. The contrast is remarkable and I think is worth studying by students of history, diplomacy, foreign policy, and even the ingredients of leadership itself. Let's begin with the fact that President Kennedy recognized immediately when faced with what historians today still call the most dangerous 13 days in the history of mankind, he immediately recognized that we should reach out to other countries, that we should not try to handle this crisis alone in a dangerous and complicated world. And so, in addition to instructing our ambassador to the United Nations, Adlai Stevenson, to raise the issue at the Security Council at the UN, he also urged the State Department to take the matter to the little regional United Nations, the Organization of American States, and ask for their help and participation because he wanted the U.S. to be consistent with international law, a subject to which I will return at the end of this uh, talk. And the OAS, with only one abstention from the, uh, the delegate from a country who could not get instructions back in time uh, from his uh, home government. With only that one abstention, the OAS unanimously supported the blockade, quarantine as we called it, of Cuba to keep out Soviet nuclear equipment and other offensive uh, weapons and that converted the U.S. action into, and, and many of them actually participated. I believe some of the larger Latin American countries sent planes and ships to participate in that blockade. And that converted our action into a regional security action. And under the United Nations Charter, regional security actions are authorized and permitted and Kennedy, from start to finish, wanted to make certain that whatever action the United States took was consistent with international law. But in addition, he wanted to make certain that our major allies were fully informed, briefed on all the facts. And he sent a high-level emissary to brief the British Prime Minister, another one to brief the German, West German Chancellor, another one to brief the NATO Council, and another to brief the most formidable and in some ways uh, obstreperous of all our uh, allies, the uh, friendly allies, uh, General de Gaulle, the President of France. 
And for that difficult assignment, he selected uh, our senior diplomat, the former Secretary of State, Dean Acheson. And Mr. Acheson went into de Gaulle's office and read to him the speech that uh, JFK and I had worked on for the night of October 22nd, and I'll return to that uh, this, this evening as well. And uh, then at the conclusion, he said to de Gaulle, Mr. President, waiting in your outer office is an Air Force colonel who has the pictures that were taken from a U-2 plane of these Soviet nuclear installations or the beginnings thereof on Cuba. And I would like him to come in here and he will, with a pointer, show you exactly what is there and what it means and why President Kennedy is taking the reason he's taking. He said why he's taking this action. And de Gaulle, to Atchison's surprise, waved him off and said, no, no, that won't be necessary. The word of the President of the United States is enough for me. I don't believe that would happen today. <laughs> Second big difference was that Kennedy's foreign policy from the very beginning was bipartisan just as it had been for decades before these uh, last uh, eight years. He appointed to his cabinet key, two key members of the XCOM that gathered to decide our response to the nuclear missiles in Cuba. Bob McNamara, the Secretary of Defense, who I believe was here on an earlier occasion, and Douglas Dillon, the Secretary of Treasury. I often told people that uh, Kennedy didn't uh, make up his cabinet, his cab compose his cabinet of big uh, uh, campaign contributors. There was only one $10,000 contributor in the entire cabinet. That was Douglas Dillon who had given $10,000 to Nixon. Another Republican uh, in, the, uh, key, uh, in the group was uh, our national security advisor, George Bundy, because Kennedy believed that foreign policy in a dangerous world should not be a bitter uh, partisan uh, debate topic. And clearly during the missile crisis, uh, it was not, and it was fortunate that those three uh, very good people were there uh, uh, to participate. We have not seen that kind of bipartisanship during these, uh, in foreign policy in particular, uh, during these last eight years, and as a result, uh, uh, partisanship uh, has increased over the war in Iraq and a good many other uh, foreign policy uh, uh, issues at the present time. And, that is sad and uh, potentially dangerous. Next big difference, and here I am involved, is the subject of communicating with the enemy or even negotiating with the enemy and above all, making clear to enemies as well as friends and particularly the American people exactly what the facts are what our case is, and what our response is. I first learned about the problem on the morning of Tuesday, October 16, when the president called me in and told me that U-2 planes flying over Cuba that previous weekend had taken photographs which Air Force and CIA photo interpreters and analysts, geniuses clearly, had been able to tell were the beginnings of these installations for the kinds of intermediate range that's long enough to reach uh, almost any part of the United States and many parts of the Western Hemisphere, the kind of intermediate range missiles 
which carry a nuclear payload and which had previously been photographed during uh, May 1 uh, parades uh, in uh, Red Square. He called together immediately a, a group of advisors, and I'll come back in a moment, and he wanted uh, me, and he also wanted Robert Kennedy, the Attorney General, not that either one of us were experts in national security affairs, but he wanted not the National Security Council, whose membership is decided by statute and included some people whose advice he didn't particularly want, but also because everybody in Washington wants to show how important he is by attending National Security Council meetings and then really show how important he is by bringing his deputy to the meeting and the deputy has to show he's important, he brings an assistant, and pretty soon there are more people in the room than can make the kind of crisp decision that John F. Kennedy wanted, and too many people in the room to keep a secret. And as Kennedy said to us in that first meeting, that first meeting was that same morning of October 16th, not two months later after he'd gone home to cut brush on his ranch, in that first meeting that morning, he said, the Soviets don't know that we know. And let's not have a lot of word going out that there are emergency meetings in the White House. Let's not have a pile up of limousines around the White House. Let's not have everybody canceling their schedules, changing their speaking commitments, and, uh, and all the rest. And we then began a series of um, all day, and sometimes it almost seemed like all night uh, meetings. But by October 22nd, the following Monday, only six days later, the president was prepared with our consensus, which he had checked out carefully himself, another subject I'll come back to, and to uh, tell the American people without sending them into panic what uh, we had discovered and what we were going to do about it. Since then, especially during these last few years when I have uh, uh, spoken on the anniversary and otherwise of the Cuban Missile Crisis, Men who are a dozen or so years younger than I have uh, come up to me after the speech and thank, after my speech, and thanked me for making President Kennedy's speech to the country on the night of October 22nd so scary that they were able to convince their college girlfriends this was their last night on earth. <laughs> Perhaps, perhaps the most important difference, perhaps the most important difference is that at that first meeting, Kennedy demanded that those of us around the table, and there were about a dozen of us, give him every possible option he had. This country launched an unprecedented unilateral invasion of Iraq without any evidence that it was involved in 9-11 without any hard evidence that it had weapons of mass destruction, without any proof that it was threatening the security of the United States with only that, in, with that invasion as the only option from which to choose. And Kennedy wanted to know every option, every military option, every diplomatic option, every combined military diplomatic option, unilateral options, multilateral options, even the option of doing nothing at all. After all, he said, our West European allies have been sitting on a Soviet nuclear bullseye all these years. They've learned to live with it. Maybe we'll have to learn to live with it too. But that was a totally different approach and it was fortunate that he took that approach because everybody's first option, which seemed easy and logical, 
was the so-called surgical airstrike. Sounded good. Air Force, U.S. Air Force swoops in, bombs those missile sites, flies away. Status quo ante has been restored. Oh, no, it hasn't. And not only that, but Kennedy, who, had, who was accustomed to asking hard questions, and one of the reasons he put Bobby and me on the, uh, uh, asked us to attend the National Security Council meetings after the Bay of Pigs was because he knew we could ask hard questions on his behalf, seeing the government and the country as he did as president and not merely through the eyes of one department or one agency or one particular constituency. So the first hard question he asked of the Air Force was, how sure are you in this so-called surgical airstrike? You'll get them all. And they said, well, we think we're pretty good and we think we'll get 80%. There were 15 such installations. If they got uh, four out of five, um, 12, pretty good, but the three remainders could be fired and uh, wipe out uh, three major cities of the United States, if not uh, more. And then the Air Force said, and we're not sending our planes over Cuba just to, uh, with, uh, just to target those uh, planes, uh, those uh, missiles. We also want to target any Soviet surface-to-air missiles so they don't shoot us down while we're doing it. And we also should target any Soviet and Cuban air bases so they don't send bombers over Florida while uh, we're busy uh, in uh, Cuba. And then after we've bombed the length and breadth of Cuba, we'll certainly have to have an invasion to restore uh, order out of the chaos that's been created, some surgical uh, strike. And later, uh, well, I should add that, uh, and here again, I played a small role. Uh, Bobby Kennedy said that uh, a um, sudden strike which would kill the Cuban workers at the bases, and the president uh, reminded us more than once that Cuba was not our target here. Cuba was not a real threat to the United States. Soviet Union had put those missiles there, and it was the Soviet system that threatened the West. And Bobby said to, uh, for us to kill uh, Cuba, innocent Cuban workers with a sudden strike sounds like Pearl Harbor, except it's Pearl Harbor in reverse with the U.S. as the attacker instead of the attacked. And finally, it was decided that there should be some kind of warning. Air Force wasn't happy about warning their targets. But I was, I was asked to devise a message to Khrushchev from Kennedy to be secretly delivered by a high-level emissary. And the message was to notify Mr. Khrushchev that we would be sending an airstrike or would have already sent it by the time he got the message if he didn't give the right response against his missiles in Cuba. And before I could put pen to paper, I immediately received from everybody around the table advice and instructions. Don't make it an ultimatum. Superpowers don't respond to an ultimatum. Don't make it complicated. Khrushchev will just negotiate that for weeks while the work is completed on the missile sites. Don't make it one-sided or posterity will, if there is any, will blame us for mankind's final war. I went back to my office and it was impossible to write a message that met all those conditions. Of course it was an ultimatum. Of course it was complicated. Of course, it sounded like we were uh, about to start a war. And when I reported that I did not think a notice could be sent that was consistent with those conditions, support for the airstrike option began to dwindle and support for the other option that Bob McNamara had uh, uh, proposed in our uh, second meeting, if not the first, began to grow, and that was a blockade 
around Cuba that uh, would make put the Soviets on notice that we were not going to accept the status quo and if there was more equipment to come in, possibly even nuclear warheads, we had no idea whether they were on the island yet or not, that uh, we were determined to uh, prevent all of this. And that blockade idea began to evolve into a quarantine. Blockade can be an act of war. Quarantine has, sounds a little less harsh. And we did not mean the blockade to keep out food, medicine, gasoline from Cuba that would have brought uh, the Cuban economy uh, to its uh, knees because, as uh, Kennedy said, uh, Cuba is not our enemy here. I was struck by the parallels when I visited the Franklin D. Roosevelt Museum not so long ago up in Hyde Park. They had an exhibit on Roosevelt as commander-in-chief and how he had to tell his military commanders. I know you're all upset with Japan for having attacked us, but remember it's Nazi Germany that's the real threat to Western civilization. Let's focus first on Germany, later we can attend to Japan. Very much like what Kennedy was saying, let's focus on the Soviet Union in this crisis and later we can worry about Cuba. So uh, his demanding those options made all the difference in the world because sure enough, when he met with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, they demanded once again an airstrike and invasion and Kennedy reminded them that he had responsibilities for what would happen to West Berlin and Western Europe and the free world in general and did not want to precipitate a world war which he thought that an airstrike and invasion surely would. And when Kennedy called together the congressional leaders, who uh, probably a good thing were in recess uh, uh, during that uh, uh, time, they all wanted to have an airstrike and invasion. Hit them hard, said some uh, Democrats as well as Republicans. And when Kennedy left that meeting, which was just an hour before he went on the air, October 22, with his scary speech, and he was angry, and he didn't usually get rattled by criticism and disagreement, but as we walked over from, uh, the, I was not in that meeting, but as we walked over from his office to home where he wanted to change his, into his television suit and shirt, and, and Ty, he was uh, grumbling, and then he said, well, he said, after all, that, when we first heard about the threat, that was our first reaction to. First reactions are not necessarily the right reactions, and that's why Kennedy demanding options showed the best kind of leadership. And finally, I want to emphasize his insistence on compliance with international law. I've already explained how he went to the UN, he went to the OAS, and there are those who say now, international law is uh, some kind of legal nicety in, uh, in peacetime and when things are smooth, but uh, if there's, we've even heard this in recently in the last year or two, if there's a possibility of a mushroom cloud on the horizon, then uh, law should not play any part in it uh, at all. And we have been violating international law left and right. Last Friday, I addressed the uh, conference sponsored by the Amer American Bar Association in New York. I know one friend of mine is here tonight who was in that audience there, in which I talked about the importance of law particularly in times of emergency, because those are the times when it's too easy, when you're, all the values you hold dear could be wiped out by an enemy. There are those who say, let's wipe out those values in order to confront the enemy. I urge, if I can find it, and if the lights are strong enough, I can read it, I urge any of you visiting New York
to see the revival of my favorite play, A Man for All Seasons, this time starring an actor whom I uh, know and like, Frank Langella. In that play about Sir Thomas More, later in the Catholic Church, St. Thomas More, I believe, it's the story of a brilliant, courageous lawyer who ultimately paid the ultimate price of his life because he opposed the king, King Henry VIII, whom he uh, served because he refused to find any legal loopholes permitting the uh, king uh, to uh, remarry. And in the first act, Sir Thomas is at ease with friends and family, including his future son-in-law, a man named Roper, and they are engaged in a little debate about the, the role of law, and S Sir Thomas says, even the devil should have benefit of law. And let me try to read this. So, says Roper, now you give the devil the benefit of law? Sir Thomas says, yes, what would you do? Cut a great road through the law to get after the devil? You can substitute terrorists for, or other enemies for a devil in this if you want. And Roper says, yes, I'd cut down every law in England to do that. And Sir Thomas says, oh, and when the last law was down and the devil turned round on you, where would you hide, Roper? The law is all being flat. This country is planted thick with laws from coast to coast. Man's laws, not God's. And if you cut them down, and you're just the man to do it, do you really think you could stand upright in the winds that would blow then? Yes, I'd give the devil benefit of law for my own safety's sake. I have confidence that the incoming president of the United States would agree with that sentiment and will believe in and adhere to international law, international institutions, international courts, international organizations, and international alliances. Tonight is the, probably the largest audience that I have addressed since roughly one year in Nebraska, since roughly one year after the missile crisis was peacefully resolved without the U.S. firing a shot. And my role in that crisis is uh, spelled out in my book, my new book, Consular. And I also, in a near the end chapter, talk about the planning that began for Kennedy's re-election campaign in 1964. We knew it would be difficult because of his civil rights program, which had lost him support in the South. But we talked about themes and we talked about uh, this very subject of leadership. And I then say in the book, and I'll read you one short paragraph in the book, Shortly after early, our early November planning and strategy session, I returned to Nebraska to deliver the keynote address at the annual state Democratic dinner in Omaha. I made clear the president's intention to run for re-election in 1964. My speech was subject to no instructions or clearance but reflected our earlier White House discussion, testing another possible theme for the 1964 campaign. I described JFK as a president who cares about America. I noted that there were three overriding qualities needed in a president, a creative mind, a compassionate heart and a courageous spirit. I am 
happy tonight that beginning next January 20th, we will have a new president with a creative mind, a compassionate heart, and a courageous spirit. Thank you very much.